Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure to have a session on multilateral partnerships to design policies on global green growth and sustainability at Sankalp Global Summit 2022. Today, we have a very eminent panel of three ambassadors to India. We have Ambassador Ugo Astuto, the ambassador of the European Union delegation to India. We have Ambassador Freddie Swain, the ambassador of Denmark. And we have Ambassador Ina Krishnamurti, the ambassador of the Republic of Indonesia to India, which as you know, is the current G20 chair. In the current world, everybody wants to know what is going to happen because the promise of globalization seems to be faltering. And everybody looks at diplomats to find out how can we stem the tide and can we have a way that we bring the benefits that were promised to us back on track rather than lose them in the form of war. In the last few months, with Prime Minister Modi having meetings with leaders of the European Union, Denmark and Indonesia, we have seen that there is an effort to refocus on the global green growth and sustainability agenda. And certainly the European Union, Denmark and Indonesia are not pushing back from that. They are trying to get back on, keep everything on track, which is encouraging. So today, when we look at the transformative agenda, and there is a large amount of effort to achieve the SDGs, there is the concept of bringing in private investment. And then you want to make proper impact. And when you put all this together at the crossroads, you have the Sankalp Global Summit, where all these are discussed. And I think our session is one of the prime motivators of the Sankal Global Summit 2022. I am going to come first to Ambassador Swain from Denmark, a rare diplomat who has also been a CEO of a company. You know, the, the Green Strategic Partnership 2020 between India and Denmark had a joint action plan, and it includes climate action and similar things including green hydrogen, green growth, uh, cross-sectoral energy transition, possibly role for the International Solar Alliance. Now, Ambassador, you tell us, from your point of view, how can we keep track by sticking to our green strategic partnership between India and Denmark? Thank you very much indeed. I'm sorry I'm sitting in my car, so you might see a lot of movements around me, but uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, very, very important discussion. Let me put it uh, as the first kind of remark uh, from my side, the best, most important decision that we can make in order to secure that we have the green uh, development in place is to stop the war in Ukraine. This has taken a toll on all of us it's devastating for the world economy. It's devastating for the environment and so forth. So that's the first, uh, let's say, initial remark from my side. Things are going really wrong and we have to cope with it. And I hope and I pray for India to play a role. I think you are well worth for it and you should. It. There's a moral uh, obligation for India to intervene here and to, to uh, bring the parties to, uh, to the table to find uh, a solution to that. So that's the most important thing. Coming back to Green Strategic Partnership, we decided really to um, build up an alliance with India, combining the uh, many missions of Honorable Prime Minister, whether it's Galjeva and Schwarzbarat, Green Hydrogen and so forth, and most recently, the ambition to take India from being a developing country in 25 years to being a leading uh, developed nation. We would like to be part of that. And that's why we bring in our skills, meaning our technical solutions, our experiences and so forth. So we are not here to teach and preach India what to do, but we will like to inspire you to develop the right solutions. And there's no way around India if we do not bring India into uh, this solution to all the global issues, there will be no solution, whether it's about climate, whether it's about other things. 
and then we have the STDs, we will not be able to the, really to reach any 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 tangible success on all these 17 goals without India being on board. So India has to be part of the equation. That's why we developed the Green Strategic Partnership and it's really focusing on water, energy, climate and climate financing. And I think uh, if I should highlight a little bit, uh, this is uh, really, of course, a government to government cooperation, but much more importantly, it's also facilitating and bringing in the private sector. We believe there's no way around uh, solving all these uh, global issues without bringing in uh, private financing, private competences and private companies. Those companies and the private sector at large will have to develop the technologies and so forth. But beyond that, uh, my dear friends, it's also important to ask oneself, what can I do as an individual to secure that we'll have a planet that will survive so I'm very, very fond of the uh, new initiative that will be launched very soon by Honorable Prime Minister about life, changing our lifestyle. Because we can ask the governments, we can ask diplomats, we can ask the CEOs, the researchers and whatever to do, whatever they are supposed to do. But if we as a human being, if we are not changing our behaviors and way in which we are living our life, I come from a very well-off country and so forth, but we have really all of us individually to take a responsibility. So that's why it's so important. What we are really achieving with the Indian side is to bring, um, India has a scale, we have the skills, the speed is there as to the SGDs and so forth and climate. Then the scope, whatever we are doing should not just be restricted to into Denmark or things like that. And, and fourth, uh, fifthly, then we have sustainability. So whatever we are doing has to be sustainable. And therefore, let me come back to my initial remark. The best thing we can do now is really to stop the, uh, the war in Ukraine because it's setting us back as a planet, perhaps in decades, if we can't stop this war because uh, all the money uh, will go away from the green transition. So I hope that India and all of us will really take um, development uh, under controls to secure that we can have a green, sustainable development and a future for our planet. So these were my words from my old car, which is diesel driven, and I should not uh, be uh, proud about that. But, and since we have our good colleagues from, uh, from Indonesia, it's also important that G20 will deliver. Without G20, as kind of global uh, vehicle for economic development and so forth. If you are not able to deliver in Indonesia, it will have a dire consequence on India as well. So I hope you will do whatever is needed. And of course, we all have to be part of that. So it calls for international cooperation, multilateral uh, alliances, bilateral alliances. And I would also like to say, even though you mentioned EU and Denmark, we are an integrated part of EU. We are front runners within the EU, European Union when, it's come, when it comes to the green transition. So we are very, very pleased and happy that EU is also along the same uh, lines as Denmark uh, uh, has chosen to be. So EU is a major power and a major uh, actor in the green transition, also in India, and we are in full support of that. Danyavat, thank you very much, my friend. I would like to ask you one question before you go. I agree with you, but tell me of all this funding that Denmark is putting up through the governmental sector, through the partnership, through your other funds, how do Indian entrepreneurs in the sustainability field access those funds? What are the avenues? There are two avenues, but let me start a little bit differently. Uh, yeah. Denmark hosted COP15, and there was the famous COP15 in 2009, where all the developed countries committed to, uh, um, um, let's say, uh, to transfer 100 billion of US dollars every year to the developing world. It never happened. Yet the Danish government last year decided to set aside 1% uh, of whatever uh, we will owe in that context. So that's one. Uh, one part of it. Another part, we just, when Honorable Prime Minister Modi was in Copenhagen in early May, we launched a special facility 
which will connect with Indian startups, scale-ups, and of course also companies. So they can approach us. We have the money, we have the willingness, and we are ready to connect the dots from private sector to private sector, also bringing in the scale-ups and the startups. India is the unicorn for green transition, and we would like to be part of that, putting money into that. So Team Sankalp and Intele Cap, I hope you noted that very wise words of Ambassador Swain before we say goodbye to him. Thank you for joining us today, Ambassador Freddy. Thank Have you. a good day. Have a nice discussion. Thank you. Anyway. Well, now I have the honor to come to my friend, uh, Ambassador Ina Krishnamurti. And uh, Ambassador, as G20 Chair, as the prospective ASEAN Chair, as Indonesia, you have always got a good stamp. And as I told you the other day, whenever Indonesia is Chair, the burden of expectations comes heavy on you because we all expect you to do the right thing. Now, Ambassador Swain said many things, but what do you think during your term as G20 Chair and as Indonesia, how do you see the green and sustainable cooperation going ahead? Thank you, Ambassador Gurjit, for inviting me to this important event. It's truly honored. Uh, to be in one screen with Ambassador Ugo Astuto. Um, global environmental problems, I would like to start with that, uh, require global solutions. And uh, even as we are gathered now virtually, uh, we cannot hide from the fact that the world is facing increasingly compounding challenges, uh, such as population growth, water crisis, resource scarcity, energy insecurity, as well as uh, environmental depredation. And as if those are not enough, we now uh, know that climate change could become an amplifier and multiplier of all the crisis. Uh, it would not only wipe out all development progress that has been achieved over the past decades, particularly in, in emerging economies, uh, including India and Indonesia, but it will also uh, propel us over an environmental tipping point into uncharted territory where no, no future will be sustainable. So um, I think uh, as emerging um, one of the emerging economies, uh, Indonesia recognized the significance of achieve, achieving a better and a more sustainable future for all, not only Indonesia. Um, the quality of growth is as important as its rate, and it is therefore essential for us to apply green growth principles, concepts, approaches to help the country realize these ambitious goals. Um, as to G20, um, I, I believe um, G20 is one of the um, most important environment, current environmental multilateralism there is um, because Indonesia believes that in, environmental multilateralism is, only the, is the only way to effectively coordinate efforts to tackle global challenges. Um, and for, for the multilateralism to work, we need to strengthen the strategic trust and mutual ref respect. Um, and for G20, um, for the exact reason of the collaboration, we initiated several joint meetings uh, uh, under our presidency. One of them is the G20 Joint Environment and Climate Ministers meeting. And the meeting is to give an avenue to discuss and as much as possible, we cannot, of course, uh, find solution overnight to address uh, various environmental and climate issues as we are currently confronting, including discussing the improvement and mobilization of efforts towards climate sustainability. And Ambassador Freddy already uh, shared what Denmark has done. Uh, 
This meeting, um, as well as the three lead-up meetings at the level of environment deputies uh, and climate sustainability working group, show that Indonesia is um, very strong in its uh, effort to reap the tangible result uh, towards sustainable global recovery in the framework of G20. And on um, G20 itself, uh, I think, the series of meetings under a uh, sustainability working group, as well as uh, the joint environment and climate ministers meeting, we have three priority issues. One is to, uh, supporting more sustainable re recovery. Like I said, sustainable future is very important. Enhancing land and sea-based actions. Uh, sometimes we forgot about the sea uh, as experienced by our friends in Pacific, they lose their lands because of the sea level is rising to support environmental protection and climate objectives. And the third is the, the concept that, or, or the effort that um, Ambassador of Denmark already mentioned about resource mobilization to support environmental protection and climate change uh, objectives. So um, I think um, we, uh, believe that um, the, ev the event or the meeting itself is important, but unfortunately, um, we learned uh, that the series of meetings had their own dynamics, uh, maybe because the current global backdrop and political and economic situation give that dynamics, but nevertheless, uh, in environmental uh, multilateralism through G20, um, Indonesia is thankful that all members and observers show their willingness to just sit together and discuss ways and means to make better future for the global environment. Thank you, Ambassador Bujit. Very well said, Ambassador, indeed. That is the way to try and furrow the G20. Uh, yes, the war is going on and there are tensions, but not to lose track of our future I think is right now in your hands and maybe next year in Indian hands as we try and steer the G20. Uh, very valuable comments, Ambassador. Thank you. I'll come back to you. Now I move to my dear friend and old colleague, Ambassador Ugo Astuto, uh, the Ambassador of the European Delegation. And one of the most important partners for India. I can tell you, Ambassador, that in a multipolar world, the European Union is extremely important to us and not only for green reasons. So I'm going to now leave it to you for your opening statement on how do you think that the India-EU Roadmap 2025, for instance, will take us into a more deeper and compatible sustainability partnership? Well, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Gurjit Singh for, for inviting me. I mean, I'm glad to participate in this discussion and um, uh, I'm happy to follow uh, Ambassador Krishnamurti. Actually, several of the points uh, she made uh, are also uh, relevant in my perspective. And I think I will start, as uh, Ambassador Krishnamurti said, by acknowledging and underscoring that the international community has never been challenged as, as badly as it is today for quite some time. Um, we all know that we need to act fast um, and to address climate change. Uh, we have read the IPCC report not so long ago, uh, making it very clear that the window of opportunity is closing fast. And we are challenged uh, by the Russian unjustified and unprovoked aggression against Ukraine, uh, a blatant violation of the UN Charter, and by the weaponization by Moscow of energy prices as well as uh, fertilizers prices and uh, food supply. So now, now Europe is, um, is on its way to, 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 to stop being dependent on, on Russian hydrocarbons. Um, just a figure for, for you to understand. At the beginning of the war, uh, Europe was depending on, on Russian hydrocarbons for, for, on Russian gas for 40% of the total supply. Well, today uh, it's 9%. Only 9% of our gas comes from Russia. So this is quite an achievement in a, in a short while. So let me, as, as Freddy before me, let me also make this point very clearly. Uh, Russia needs to stop, to cease hostilities, uh, to stop the aggression and to withdraw. Um, 
and and that will be indispensable also to address some of the challenges we are facing today, such as uh, food and energy inflation. But the, the the only way to towards energy sovereignty today is to stop being dependent on on hydrocarbons more generally. And and this brings me to the um, EU Green Deal strategy. I'm sure you are you are familiar with it. Uh, we have launched it well before uh, the Russian aggression back in 2020. Um, we have set ourselves very ambitious targets. Uh, we want to become the first carbon neutral continent by 2050. And we have um, adopted an equally stringent legislation, which is very important because it's no longer just a vague aspiration. We have a clear roadmap and we have uh, legal um, provisions to make sure that we achieve um, uh, and our objectives. And we have also adopted a, a new industrial strategy for a globally competitive uh, green and digital Europe. And we have reviewed our trade policy. You may have seen the paper recently uh, released. It's about making you trade um, a greener, fairer, and more sustainable. So our new generation, new trade agreements will contribute to protecting the climate, the environment, and, and labor rights uh, worldwide. Now, so the, the bad news is that globally the, the situation is getting worse pretty fast. But, but the good news is that we can do something about it. And, and the Green Deal implies a transformation of our societies and economies back in Europe, embracing the opportunities of the new industrial uh, revolution, addressing the threats that come with the emission of CO2 for a green, digital and resilient future. So business as usual is not an option. Uh, science clearly tells us that uh, climate change and biodiversity loss, unsustainable production and consumption patterns, all these are putting at risk um, the lives of the, the future generations. And companies, uh, the business sector, cannot afford anymore to doubt about the changes to come and the magnitude of these changes. So industry also needs to react. Governments need to, to, to do their part, uh, civil society, stakeholders, and the business community. And there is a huge potential for the industry uh, also emerging from this challenge. For, for example, we need to reinvent and, and build solar panels, uh, heat pumps, turbines, and all that um, added together uh, leads us to a greener energy uh, mix. Uh, you, you, you may have noted that Commissioner Simpson the, the EU Commissioner for Energy was here in uh, in Delhi not so long ago, and and uh, and we we discussed how the EU and India can work together, for instance, on on green hydrogen, also a promising perspective. It's it's equally clear that uh, in this green transition, uh, no one must be left uh, behind. So solutions must be holistic, integrated, be it domestically or, or global, because it, it's it's the most vulnerable. Uh, who are uh, most uh, affected by climate change, be it uh, in Europe or, or worldwide. And if the COVID pandemic has taught us anything, it's precisely that we, we, we no one can afford to ignore uh, his neighbor's uh, problems. As, as Ambassador Krishnamurti said, we, we need a global response to, to global challenges. So in a globalized and interconnected economy, we, we need to work together. There is no way we can work in, in isolation and achieve our objectives. And, and the international community is, is gathering soon um, with COP27 on climate and COP15 for, for biodiversity. And we, we will together, we will need to chart a predictable course uh, towards a more sustainable uh, pattern of production and consumption. And India is, is preparing for, for its G20 presidency as you said earlier, and um, in that position, India will have um, a golden opportunity to shape the global agenda also when it comes to the fight uh, against climate change. And domestically also, the changes that India is undergoing will have um, uh, a significant impact uh, on the global endeavors um, in, in the greening of our economic models. Just, just to make an example, I mean, the middle class in India is is growing fast, and um, it will it will change and uh, and shake the markets for consumer goods, for for, for food, transport, uh, travel, and, and tourism, and you you name it. 
And smart entrepreneur will have to adapt technology and business models to match these demands uh, in a sustainable manner. So the, we will need to customize uh, clean technology. And this could be uh, another opportunity for you and Indian business to meet and, and work together. Uh, so this transition must leave no one behind. So it, it needs to be inclusive. So we, we also need to, uh, to address the needs when it comes to education, uh, research, vocational training. The, the, um, the students of today must become the um, skilled innovators of tomorrow mm -hmm. in green technology. And uh, I'm glad to note here that India has the largest contingent uh, of foreign students uh, um, participating in the Erasmus uh, Plus program and sending students and scholars to, to you. Um, we also have to work on an adequate uh, digital infrastructure because the green transition we require will be underpinned by, by the digital uh, transition. So we need key enabling technology for, for the green transition. And it's important that green, this green technology be human-centric, uh, that we adopt uh, an approach which is consistent with our open and democratic societies. So le let me conclude here and just make one example of, um, of the platforms that you and India are creating to, to work together. There are many, but I would like to quote the latest one because when President von der Leyen was here in April, you may remember that together with the Prime Minister Modi, they agreed to launch a new EU India Trade and Technology Council. Yes. I think that will be another, another platform to provide a political steer, but also follow up, technical follow up in areas that are important uh, for the sustainable progress of um, both the European and the um, economy, notably on, on the digital transition. But let me close here and thank you again for. for thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, for a very comprehensive view. So if I hear both of you correctly, it is a global responsibility, this green sustainable partnership, and we have to work towards the just energy transition. That is what the G7 said to us. And that is what the G20 will also say, the just energy transition. Now, we have heard this figure of 100 billion of additional financing. But somehow where this 100 billion goes and when is never very clear. And therefore, one of the essential elements of a just energy transition is slightly a ghost-like figure of 100 billion, attractive, but you know, nobody nice knows where it is. Ambassador Krishnamurti, I want to ask you that since after you, it's G20 will come to India, FJ and then to Brazil, and possibly South Africa thereafter. This is an amazing time for the global South to stand up. Now, is it possible that while we keep searching for this 100 billion, we also quadrilaterally raise some more money for ourselves and try and lead the green and sustainable partnership rather than simply do what others tell us to do? What do you think about this idea that we do more for ourselves among ourselves? Thank you, Ambassador. Um, I think I mentioned already about our effort to um, bring our national growth and prosperity. And over the past 15 years, I think all of you have seen that Indonesia has been blessed with a strong and consistent economic growth of around 6% uh, per annual. Um, and for sure, Indonesia hopes to maintain and even improve its economic development in the next 15 years and even more. And I would like to, again, recognize that at the same time, we have to underline with bold that this to be achieved uh, with a notion of a better and more sustainable future for all, not only Indonesia, but also all countries surrounding Indonesia and also globally. Um, I think um, the most important thing you 
raised a very pertinent question. How we raise these resources from ourselves as country, Indonesia has um, established an ambitious social and economic goals uh, while injecting our uh, national development plan with priorities in economic growth, food and energy security, poverty reduction, and of course, natural resource management. And these priorities uh, actually reflect the the nation's urgent development needs as, as well as our international commitments to realize the nationally determined contributions and at the same time achieving the SDGs 2030. And because of that, we are now um, focusing on the Green Growth Program. This program is implemented jointly by our government and the Global Green Growth Institute mm -hmm. through, again, because it is injected in the development plannings, we need the planning agencies and also the, the sub-national governments to collaborate in this regard. And the, this Green Growth Program is designed to deliver, hopefully, <laughs> a sustainable and equitable uh, rise in GDP and living standards, while at the same time curbing pollutions, making infrastructure clean and resilient, using resources more efficiently. That I need to underline because usually developing countries such as ours, um, this concept of efficient is, not, is challenging. Um, because of the population and mobilization of people and valuing the often economically invisible natural assets. Uh, in economically invisible natural assets in our uh, country, um, it's underwater natural assets usually because we cannot see. So this green growth, uh, green growth program has started in 2013. Um, I think Ambassador of Denmark mentioned about uh, inclusiveness, uh, bringing various stakeholders. Um, this program include also international and national investors, as well as uh, project developers for green capital to flow. But I, I think this... Uh, sounds positive and optimistic, but uh, it is not without challenges um, because, as you may know, um, that um, as emerging countries, um, we also need the help of um, international, uh, especially uh, developed countries. Uh, in, in that regard, before I um, give you more um, views, I would like just to uh, quote two prominent figures in G20. Prime Minister Modi said that the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities is the bedrock of our enterprise for a sustainable world. So the CBDR is extremely significant for emerging economies, while President Joko Widodo said that while we all committed toward climate resilience, low carbon development, and green technology, like Ambassador Astuto said, developing countries must be included in the energy and technology transformation process. So again, the principle of inclusivity. So um, on the Green uh, Climate Fund, um, I think um, our effort has established uh, has raised uh, about $10.3 billion US mm -hmm. um, January 2018. And 2022, we have, we plan, we plan <laughs> to have raised 296 something million uh, US dollars uh, for Indonesia. Um, and hopefully, this the funding can provide financial support for to Indonesia by channeling funds to green projects and uh, programs and like I said, without challenge, uh, it's impossible because I think the biggest challenge is um, 
the appetite to development in emerging economies uh, and also how to balancing it with uh, the green understanding. So um, the this we have seen that the natural capital has been lost at an alarming rate as renewable forest and marine resources has been overexploited and depleted. Uh, air and water pollution, uh, I think we have seen it in all emerging economies. Serious problems, especially in major cities. Uh, we've seen floods here also in India. Uh, I, I do not need to mention in, in Indonesia. So urban expansion is all eating up uh, productive farmlands. So in Indonesia, again, is highly vulnerable to climate change impacts. We are the supermarket of disaster. So uh, any kind of disaster there is, um, we have experienced. As well, most of the population inhabits in low-lying coastal areas, including yes. Jakarta. So these problems, uh, it's not going to be reduced soon <laughs> it's it's going to be added more so that is why um uh, we we need inclusivity in in our strong effort to restore economic growth on a greener more inclusive development pathways that indeed uh, i think indeed. delivers better thank, thank you, you ambassador you gave us very uh, good examples of what indonesia is doing so I was going to lead from that question to Ambassador Astuto because, you know, yesterday the, at the plenary, we were told by the MEA about the trilateral cooperation development funds that MEA has launched with the UK and France. And these are part of trilateral cooperation where India and a partner country work together in a third country. And mainly these are focused on impact funds. Impact funds means to implement the SDGs. Now, my whole purpose of asking this question of whether we will do something was because I wanted to ask Ambassador Astuto, are you going to do a trilateral fund with India? But I was preparing the ground by first saying, well, we may also do something like the IPSA fund. There is an IPSA fund, India, Brazil, South Africa fund. Uh, we could make it bigger and bring it out into the public, private sector. At the moment, it works. A G to G. So trilateral cooperation is in our uh, roadmap, which is mentioned, but not elaborated, India-EU roadmap. Some of the EU members are working with India, like Germany, like uh, France, into working with. Now, when do you think that working on the green sustainability partnership, India and EU together, outside in other countries, is a feasible part and can it be done through the private sector? Well, I think that's definitely a possibility. We have also been discussing with the MEA about possible options. Something is already in place. Well, let me mention our cooperation in the framework of the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure and the I program which has been set forth. It's, it's about um, uh, uh, supporting small island developing states. So there the European Union has already decided to contribute with 5 million euros uh, to the program. So uh, in, in a way, that's already uh, an example of trilateral cooperation taking place through um, uh, the India-based uh, CDRI. Uh, and and the, clearly the situation of the small island um, um, the states in the Pacific is, is particularly vulnerable with that each, uh, climate change. So I think that's very relevant when uh, um, uh, for, for the, our discussion today. Uh, more broadly, uh, we, we can explore different options, and I think uh, the situation is such that we need to look at all stakeholders, which means that the private sector also is relevant um, uh, as a possible participant in such endeavors. We, we, the, 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 the challenge is, uh, is huge. And I don't think we can rely exclusively on public funds. So we mm -hmm. must find a way to mobilize uh, uh, private sector resources. Yes, and I'm particularly looking at some of the European pension funds, for instance, who have not been as forthcoming to come to India, let us say like American or Canadian pension fund. That is one area. And yes, I am and I'm also looking at more leveraging. I mean, if there is a uh, hundred 
million dollars to be brought in can we leverage it two or three times uh, through private uh, means through insurance and other we discussed this in a session on africa yesterday so we are actually trying to see that what is firmly put between us can it be put to greater use by bringing in the private sector and inclusive financial and uh, mechanisms which will take this forward and you rightly mentioned the importance of the pacific islands and i think indonesia needs to be complimented that they have invited the pacific islands uh, to the g20 uh, this time because that uh, their presence itself shows the seriousness with which i think the g20 will take uh, uh, issues of uh, sustainability but i think those have been interesting answers enough to set the stage for some questions if we have any do we have any questions with us today i don't see any so maybe i should continue with another question so i go back to ambassador krishna murthy ambassador krishna murthy indonesia needs to be credited that despite the pangs of war you decided not to change your initial focus on digitization health and energy transition for your g20 uh, focus can you tell me what are you planning to do in this particularly in the part of sustainability how will you be bringing this into sustainability discussion Uh, thank you, Ambassador. I think the three priorities issue of Indonesia presidency in G20 is actually uh, representing um, many key elements of SDG 2030. Um, health is undeniable, undeniable sector for emerging uh, economies uh, to think about after the pandemic, because. When we end, not end, we were still in a pandemic, we believe, and not yet endemic. We already enter another kind of a trend, which is monkeypox. So we have experience when um, the system is so um, um, disturbed and disrupted uh, early on in, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So I believe health is, is most important sector after COVID-19 and, um, and part of SDGs. If we don't have health, we don't have development. Yes. That's for sure. And the digitalization, I believe it is important because as a, a, a trend, it's not going to stop. It's not in the past. It's, it's, it's the future. The future of jobs is in digitalization. The future of economy is in digitalization. This future of education is in the digitalization. So the future of the world, the human being is in digitalization. So I, I believe uh, the two priorities are key to the achievement of sustainable development. And furthermore, it is apparent that after uh, the pandemic and then the war in Ukraine and then the uh, tension in uh, Asia, what else can uh, be more important than the energy security, which also have connection with the insecurity in food. So I, I believe um, the three priorities are uh, actually um, part of uh, our way uh, to achieve sustainable development and sustainable future. Thank you. I think that is a very valuable statement you have made. Again, I go back to my original theme, trying to keep things on track rather than let the dogs of war eat our flesh. Uh, now, Ambassador Astuto, my final question to you is this. You mentioned the Technology and Trade Council, which has been agreed between India and EU. But that is also part of a larger arrangement that we would complete our 
parallel agreements on investment and trade very soon. But if those were to come about, there would be many more financial guarantee system, financial flows, other things could happen. So that could actually be a big enabler to the sustainability partnership, the way we are looking at it in the private sector with additional finance. What is your current prognosis on how the India-EU trade and investment negotiations are going? Thank you. Well, uh, look, I'll put it this way. I mean, th there's been a clear political commitment from both sides, from the Indian side and the European Union uh, to engage, uh, and, uh, and including setting a very ambitious deadline, which is that we would like to, 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 to come to a... Um, uh, to, uh, to a, to a, to a finalization, um, so to, to an agreement um, before the end of 2023, before the respective um, electoral cycles. Um, so the commitment and the engagement is there. Uh, we have had the first uh, round of negotiation here in Delhi um, uh, in June, and the second round is about to start in Brussels in, uh, in early October. Uh, it's, it's a complex negotiation. Uh, it's very broad uh, because we have agreed that we want to reach um, an ambitious, a comprehensive and equally balanced free trade agreement. Um, the negotiation, as you know, were interrupted in 2013 and the world has changed uh, between 2013 and 2022. India has changed, uh, but the European Union also. So clearly there are a number of issues that need to be addressed and then discussed. But again, let me let me go back to the to my initial proposition, the, the, the political commitment is clearly there and we shall do our best uh, to use this window of opportunity. If I may, I, I will also yes. come back to, to one of your previous remarks and, um, mm -hmm. and also some of the remarks of Ambassador uh, Krishna Murtis, simply to, to, to recall another major policy initiative launched by the European Commission, Global Gateway, uh, which is about um, uh, building infrastructure which are inclusive, uh, transparent, and sustainable by sustainable, sustainable environmentally, but also socially and fiscally. And we have seen infrastructure which did not really respond to the needs of the communities. So it, it's a it's a global uh, initiative uh, which also comes with um, with a, with a team Europe approach. So we want to bring together. Uh, all uh, EU member states, but also the EU financial institutions, uh, the European Investment Bank, as well as national financial institutions and private uh, uh, stakeholders. And together with Global Gateway, we are setting in place an initiative, a program, uh, EFSD, which is precisely about what you were talking about, which is to try to offer guarantees uh, to the private sector that we use in order to help uh, the private sector to chip in and invest in, um, in the green transition, which is indispensable uh, for, for the future welfare of all of us. And interesting, uh, as, as um, uh, two of the sectors mentioned by Ambassador Krishnamurti are also included in Global Gateway, because we talk about infrastructure in a broad sense. It's not just about um, uh, roads and bridges, but health, the health sector is comprised in uh, Global Gateway, because as the Ambassador said, um, you, you, you can have no development if you don't have uh, health. And digitalization is very much part of the of the um, of the global gateway because digitalization is key uh, for the for the change of paradigm of our economies and societies. Very true, very true, and well said, Ambassador. Yes, I was going to, if I come to the global gateway, you know that is again one of the big things that we are expectantly waiting for, which will change the focus of many kinds of connectivity. And you know, there is the India-EU connectivity partnership, and it can all feed into that. Uh, but that really requires big bucks. And those big bucks, when you start repairing Ukraine, may not be coming so easily. That is our fear. So while we don't give up on that at all, and we want to work on that, we want to keep focusing on achieving the SDGs which is what the Global Circle Forum is trying to do, because we feel there the bucks required are smaller, can be more focused, and we are now trying to see how to leverage them more. Now, many EU countries have been actually very supportive of this movement with 
within India and as India worked with Africa and in ASEAN countries. So we are trying to expand that and your contributions today, both you and Ambassador Krishnamurti and earlier Ambassador Swain, have actually been most useful in telling us that the direction that you are taking, despite the problem of war, remains consistent. But the challenge of war is upon us. So we all need to continue to do, and including India, we will do. I think you heard recently Mr. Modi talk to Mr. Putin. And I think uh, Indonesia President Jokowi has been to see not only Mr. Putin and Mr. Zelensky, but seven other European leaders. So I think efforts are afoot. But wars are difficult things to stop. And we need some, you know, really good thoughts to come. And meanwhile, we need to make sure that the destruction which was happening even before the war and due to the pandemic is curtailed. And I think that is what the G20 will do and in which the EU remains a major, major important partner. Because you have always focused your attention on functional cooperation. And we really value that. And as Indonesia, we have always seen that India and Indonesia often think alike, what I call the masala boom boom effect. You know, we both eat the same spices, but call them by different names. And yet we come together saying the same thing. So I think with all that coming through, what I get from today's session is certainly war must stop. And we all must make great effort to it. Secondly, the SDGs and the green and sustainable partnership remains important ever more. And all of us from all sides are ready to do our bit. There is the danger that the Ukraine crisis may suck out certain amount of financing, which should have otherwise come to development. We should look at trying to use whatever money is coming for development by bringing in the private sector and leveraging it. And as you said, provide guarantees. So it's not only, uh, you know, uh, putting things on the table, but making the table larger. I see one question before you go. Tanvi Deshpande, do you see some potential for the transfer of sustainable technologies between developing and developed countries? How can the EU contribute to the creation of an enabling technology ecosystem? So the only question we have to you, Ambassador. Yes, thank, thank you very much, Ambassador. Well, first let me say, I mean, you 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 refer to Ukraine crisis, but actually it's a it's a war and it's a it's a Russian aggression. So it's important to remember the the, the, the what, what's happening and the root causes of the current crisis. On on um, on uh, sustainable technology, I think it's a good point. I, I referred earlier to the creation of this uh, Trade and Technology Council, which is precisely about discussing together with India what, what are going to be the key technology uh, for the green transition, for instance, or in any case, or what are the technologies that are about to shape the future. And here, the, the digital transition is a, is a, is cool. And then it's it's also it's also about working together um, in, in fostering. Um, contacts between our respective academic works. Uh, I think, Ambassador, you are, you are very familiar with programs such as Marie Curie. Uh, I mentioned earlier Erasmus Plus. Um, he, he, our, our respective uh, scientific communities need to need to come together to create a culture of common work, uh, so that it makes it easier uh, in the future to the, the cross uh, fertilization uh, when it comes to this global endeavor, which is to change the paradigm of our, of our economies and to have more sustainable um, uh, production and, and consumption uh, patterns. And then, obviously, um, uh, that the business community um, uh, has an important role to play, and the um, having a, having an open an open an open an open space when it comes to trade and uh, investment. Is, uh, is uh, inevitably an important factor and also when it comes to the sharing of technology. Uh, the sharing of technology also happens on a, on a commercial basis and simply uh, via um, companies uh, investing, uh, Indian companies in Europe or European companies in India. So I think all, all of these um, uh, facets uh, may, may, may be regarded as uh, contributing 
uh, to the development and the sharing of technologies, uh, which will be uh, important in the green transition we are facing now. Thank you very much. Ambassador Krishna Murthy, any closing comments from you? I think, like I said um, in, in the beginning, that after all the, the global dynamics uh, with the pandemic, with the war, with whatever happens around us, uh, I think climate change is the most significant because it poses as amplifier and multiplier of the crisis. So um, I think you heard three ambassadors talking about global challenge need global response. Yes. Global challenge needs global efforts. So I think uh, what we need to do now is to set aside our differences and our effort to have sustainable future. That's my last point. Thank you, Ambassador Gurjit. Thank you so much for having me. My closing comment as a takeaway from this very important session. Everything which is said is important. But I don't want to sit back and say everybody else do something while I watch. So I'm going to work with Sankal to see whether we can raise a impact investment fund, getting more money from Indonesia, India, South Africa, Brazil, the global south, and put it into the hinterland of the global south, along with our partners from the European Union and others but become, let us say, bigger partners of channelizing money, providing more insurance, providing guarantees, and doing whatever we can that we have been done through development cooperation in a more focused manner. Thank you very much for this rather invigorating session and your time, Ambassador Astuto, Ambassador Krishnamurti. Thank you very much and wish you all the best for the G20 coming up. Thank you, Sankal Forum.